Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the second day of the last week of the internship. Uh, I just want to start by saying that we're keeping the best for last. Today with us is uh, Dr. Amy Fox. Uh, she's doing a great presentation about the induced seismicity related to oil and gas operations. You guys want to pay attention to uh, this lecture and to this person because she's one of a kind. <laughs> if you don't know who Dr. Amy Fox is, I'm going to tell you right now. Dr. Amy Fox earned her undergraduate degree in geology from University of New Hampshire and a PhD in geophysics from Stanford University. At Stanford University, she was a part of the infamous Dr. Mark Zubak's research group specializing in geomechanics. She has been involved in geomechanical consulting since 1998, and she's the co-founder and president of Inlight Geoscience Limited. She's based in Calgary, Canada. She has been involved in a number of induced seismicity investigations in Western Canada. In addition to consulting, Amy volunteers for professional organizations and works hard to promote understanding and application of geomechanic discipline in multiple industries. Dr. Amy, thank you so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to hear what I have to say. I've got a uh, pointer going on here um, so that you could kind of follow along as I point to things on the slides. Um, my outline for today is uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about some terminology that everybody needs to be on the same page about. And then um, I'll go over a brief history of induced seismicity. Very brief. Um, there's a, a lot of history behind this topic that I can't quite get into, but I want to give you an idea of how maybe the focus areas have changed over time. And then I'll talk about where we are today with our understanding of induced seismicity. And um, then for about the second half of the talk, I'd like to get into the actual geomechanics of induced seismicity. So we'll get a little bit technical there, um, but I don't want to go over people's heads. I think that if any of you have seen Hamad Sarush's talk um, earlier in this series, I think that'll be helpful. We'll be touching on probably some of the same topics. Um, and then at the end, we'll um, have some time for questions and answers. So what, the, what you see here is a graphic that is kind of all over the internet in various forms, um, but it tries to illustrate some of the various things that can cause induced seismicity. And uh, so you'll see oil and gas extraction and CO2 storage shale gas development and fracking or hydraulic fracturing, which we'll talk a lot about today. Geothermal energy can also cause induced earthquakes. So it may be green power, so-called green power, but still has some of the same issues. Mining, um, even overwhelming precipitation can cause earthquakes. And then uh, one of the oldest known causes of induced seismicity is damming up rivers to create reservoirs for um, water. So for terminology, um, there is this, in different areas you'll hear people get much more particular about this than I'm going to be, um, but there are these terms induced versus triggered. And some people say that induced seismicity is, um, refers to earthquakes that would not have happened if it weren't for whatever we did as humans to cause them versus triggered, which would be um, kind of a, an earthquake that was probably going to happen naturally at some point in time, but was um, accelerated perhaps or made larger in magnitude or just made more severe or problematic by the human activity. I'm not going to be very particular. I'm mostly just going to use the word induced uh, for everything but that some, in some areas people are much more strict about how those terms get used. Um, Stanford happen, happens to have uh, one of the best groups right now um, keeping tabs and doing research on induced seismicity and they call it the Center for Induced and Triggered Seismicity. So they, they do make that distinction. Um, and then earthquake magnitude. So if you're not familiar with seismology, there's different ways to talk about earthquake magnitude, and they're not all equal. 
especially when you get into the larger events. So um, this is a, a chart that kind of shows some a comparison between some different types of earthquake magnitude scales. And one of the things you'll notice is that at the smaller numbers or the smaller magnitude earthquakes, the, they don't vary too much. It, the differences get larger the higher you go in the magnitude scale. And most of the induced events that we're gonna talk about are at this low end of the scale. So um, if you're not familiar with earthquake magnitude, uh, I do have a slide later on that talks about what different earthquakes kind of feel like. Um, the threshold for feeling an earthquake is probably down somewhere in the two to three range, magnitude two to three, which isn't even on this scale. Um, to, but of course, it depends how close you are to the earthquake, how deep it is, et cetera. Um, but the induced events tend to be between, let's say, zero and typically five, maybe six for a very large induced event. If you're familiar with um, microseismic technology, if you've had any presentations on that earlier in the series, you'll know that the typical magnitude of microseismic events, which help us map our hydraulic fractures, for example, those are in the negative numbers, so very, very small events. So you'll see some mentions of earthquake magnitude throughout the presentation. I just want you to understand that the exact number depends on what scale you're using. I also want to talk very briefly about risk versus hazard. So when we talk about earthquake risk, we're really talking about um, what are the chances we're going to cause an earthquake with what we're doing. But hazard is really quite different, and this will become apparent in one of my examples later on. Um, you know, hazard also involves um, the effects, the negative effects of what the induced seismicity um, might cause. Like, does it cause building damage? Does it um, endanger people's safety? Um, does it cause infrastructure damage? So there is a difference there between the technical risk versus, you know, the effects on, on people and structures. And so mitigation is a word we use to refer to our efforts to minimize the, both the risk and the potential damage and the hazard and the um, negative effects of the induced seismicity. And one element of mitigation is usually monitoring. So monitoring involves um, some kind of measurements or um, trying to keep track of whether or not induced events are happening, where they're happening, how large they are, et cetera. And there's different ways to do that. There's micro seismic monitoring. There's, um, you can monitor on the surface. You can monitor inside of wells, down hole, we call that down hole monitoring. So there's different ways to monitor. And finally, the last term that we're gonna use a couple different ways is injection. So a lot of induced events uh, occur because of injection, but injection can be um, a factor in different types of oil and gas operations. So you might be injecting fluid because you wanna store it in the earth. For example, gas storage is something that we do sometimes when prices are low or, or demand is low and we wanna store that for later use. So we might inject for storage, we might inject for enhanced um, reservoir development. So EOR is enhanced oil recovery. You may have heard that term before. Um, something like water flooding, where are we in a more in a conventional reservoir, we flood it with water to try to kind of push the hydrocarbons closer to the wells that we can extract them with. So injection related induced seismicity can refer to multiple types of operations. So let's go over a brief history of induced seismicity. Um, one of the kind of better documented, more modern cases of induced seismicity happened at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal in Colorado where wastewater was being disposed in deep wells. And it was close to Denver, which is a major city in Colorado. So. Um, that kind of increased or, or decreased the tolerance for induced events, let's say. The injection zone was almost four kilometers deep and um, the earthquake started just a few months after the injection started. So here on the plot on the right, you can see in 1962, 
they started injecting and right away induced events started happening. And then when the injection amounts went down, then the seismicity events went down. And so you can see a very good correlation, especially here when no fluid was injected for several months, the seismicity rate went down. Um, in the end, it's towards the end of the operations, this caused um, three magnitude five or 5.5 events, which um, definitely could be felt, caused actual damage, and um, definitely caused some public concern. So operations actually were stopped at this um, site at that time. So this is one of the better documented early cases, but that said, induced seismicity has been happening for, we know, over, well, probably about 200 years. There are documented cases from the 1800s, um, and there is a, but the, most of those early, early cases were from the building dams and impounding water on the surface. Also mining is probably responsible for some of the older ones as well. So that figure I just showed came from a review paper published by the US Geological Survey in 1990. It's an excellent paper. Um, and at that time, they concluded that the of the well-documented cases of induced seismicity, most of them were associated with water flooding operations for enhanced recovery of hydrocarbon. Um, that you'll see is no longer the case, but it, in 1990, that was the case. And they offer several examples, and this is a good one from the Rangeley oil field in Colorado, where fluid was injected and then withdrawn and then injected again. And you can see the seismicity rate go down when the fluid was, was, was withdrawn instead of injected and up again when it was injected. And actually they were able to calculate the pressure threshold at which if you went above that pressure, you were likely to initiate some earthquakes. So um, this is a, a really good example of that. They also tabulated in that same paper um, many, many examples of induced seismicity around the world, um, including those events that were caused by different types of operations, not just oil and gas. This particular report was um, focused on in things that were happening in wells, so it didn't really include um, things like building dams or civil engineering type activities but it does show a range of causes for the induced seismicity. So you see here, waste disposal, secondary recovery, that would be that, probably that water flooding and some kind of enhanced recovery of hydrocarbons, solution mining, um, geothermal. So you can see already by 1990, we had a quite a long list of the different types of operations that could cause induced seismicity. Um, a couple that aren't on that list, I already mentioned construction and civil engineering, also, water impoundment or dam building isn't included. And in fact, in 1967, there was a very significant magnitude six or greater earthquake in India that resulted in quite a few deaths. Um, estimates up to about 200 people lost their lives because of that earthquake. It also doesn't include reservoir depletion, which is another very common cause of induced seismicity in terms of oil and gas activities. Um, a very famous example is the Groningen field in the Netherlands, which has been um, has been in operation for decades and has caused significant significant subsidence and induced earthquakes and um, lots of damage because it's in a pretty highly populated area. So induced seismicity has been around for quite a while, maybe hasn't been in the public eye very much. Um, but that started to change kind of around the year 2010, uh, maybe a little bit before then. But um, what we saw happening that at that time was the rise of unconventional oil and gas um, development in North America and around the world. But it really, really took off in North America. And involved in that, developing unconventional resources was um, a lot of wastewater and that wastewater was being disposed of into deep um, deep formations and that started causing a lot of earthquakes. So there's this great 
quote from a New Yorker article that came out in 2015, and I'll just read through it. It says, until 2008, Oklahoma experienced an average of one to two earthquakes of magnitude three or greater each year. In 2009, there were 20. The next year, there were 42. In 2014, there were 585, nearly tripled the rate of California, which is really striking. Um, including smaller earthquakes in the count, there were more than 5,000. This year, which would have been 2015, there has been an average of two earthquakes per day of magnitude three or greater. So that's how, uh, how striking the increase in the earthquakes was in that area at that time due to oil and gas activities. So that was mostly wastewater disposal and, and it was well accepted, let's say, um, in the industry that disposing of wastewater into deep reservoirs was um, causing induced seismicity. What was not well accepted at the time or even still today in some areas is that hydraulic fracturing can cause induced seismicity. So hydraulic fracturing, which we've probably already talked about throughout this internship, um, but it's the practice of injecting a large amount of fluid very quickly into a well bore in order to create a fracture that extends out away from the well so that it provides a pathway for the hy hydrocarbons to get from very low permeability, low porosity reservoirs to get to the well. Um, and, you know, we've gone from in about 2010, we had maybe, we had some multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, but um, I'd say 10 or 20 stages was considered quite a few at that time. And now we've got wells with over 100 stages. So that means we've created 100 fractures in that well, trying to connect the well to the reservoir. So it involves a lot of huge volumes of fluids, um, high rates, high pressures. And so it's easy intuitively to think that could be causing some earthquakes underground, but the industry didn't really admit it for a very long time. So the first, and I even question, um, I have a question mark there because maybe there's an earlier one, but the, the first really conclusive link to hydraulic fracturing was actually here in Canada. And so what you're looking at is um, the rate of background natural earthquakes in uh, the Western Canada sedimentary basin from about 1985 to 2015. You can see uh, the black line here is the cumulative. Each year is in blue. And then the maximum um, observed magnitude of a natural earthquake is this purple box here. So you can see uh, very few earthquakes over time, pretty low magnitudes, five or less in general. And so that's the background seismicity or the natural seismicity in the basin. If we then look at the disposal induced, and like I said, everybody was admitting that yes, disposal was causing induced earthquakes. You can see uh, quite a higher number of earthquakes per year. The magnitudes are a bit higher than the natural seismicity. There's one very large, well, largest 5.5 magnitude event um, here, and it's got a question mark on it because um, the rest are quite a bit lower. But in general, higher than the background, natural rate of seismicity, higher magnitudes, and accumulating over time as, as oil and gas development continued over time. Now, the final plot is hydraulic fracture induced. And so what you see starting about 2000, a couple of induced earthquakes, again, pretty low magnitude, and then around 2010 is when things really took off. And, and that's when hydraulic fracturing really took off in the unconventional uh, plays here in Canada. And so there's a very close link between the hydraulic fracture activity and these induced events. Just looking at the time here, I'm doing pretty well. So um, I was at a uh, induced seismicity conference last fall and um, one of the speakers said that the industry's response to induced seismicity in unconventional reservoirs was kind of like the five stages of grief. Um, at first, just outright denial that hydraulic fractures could cause induced seismicity, and then anger, and then bargaining and depression and acceptance. And I would argue 
that the state we're in now is a, a six step and that's one of frustration because um, we want to be responsible and try to reduce the amount of induced seismicity that's happening, make sure that it doesn't have any negative effects, uh, but we're not quite there yet in terms of science and being able to do it. So that brings me to where we are today with induced seismicity. Um, so we know injection induces earthquakes, um, and that's the most common cause of induced seismicity today, particularly in oil and gas. Um, and so we have lots of indicators that um, we can, lots of ways we can link events to injection activities. One way is that the location of the event corresponds to where we're injecting fluid. That one's pretty straightforward. Um, one we're going to talk about a little bit later is if the crust the Earth's crust is in a critically stressed state, consistent with the increase in pressure being sufficient to induce slip on a pre-existing fault. That's kind of a loaded sentence. Has, there's a lot of components to that, and we'll get into the details in the next section. Um, another indicator is that the, and we just saw an example of that with the Western Canada sedimentary basin, and that's that the seismicity doesn't align either in time or space or frequency or magnitude with what we observe for natural seismicity in an area. And another is that the timing of the events correlates to the timing of injection or the pressure increase. But um, one of the things I think I skipped over when we were talking about the Rocky Mountain case, the, uh, that first injection case I talked about is that the earthquakes continued for two years after um, operations ceased. So it's not an immediate um, response. It, it can, there can be a time delay between whatever we're doing in the subsurface and um, when the earthquakes happen. So some of the major challenges that remain today in terms of induced seismicity are in quantifying the stresses in the earth. It takes quite a bit of data and effort to do it. I don't know, but I suspect that Dr. Sroosh probably um, talked about that quite a bit. Um, and that, it, that relates directly to this bullet point up here, which is trying to determine if the crust is in a critically stressed state. Um, another major challenge is identifying fractures and faults ahead of time. So uh, we can only attempt to avoid pre-existing faults in the subsurface if we know they're there. And then another challenge is predicting earthquake magnitude. So how do we know that if we inject a certain amount of fluid over a certain amount of time, um, how can we know what size earthquake that might predict? Right now, we, we're not there. So what we have in most places where induced seismicity is an issue it is uh, something similar to this. This is from the Oil and Gas Authority of the United Kingdom where they've instituted um, what is commonly referred to as a traffic light system or stoplight protocol. And that's where um, they have a plan for what to do if hydraulic, this is for hydraulic fracturing specifically, they have a plan for what they're gonna do in the fracturing process. And they have a plan for what to do if they start to induce earthquakes. Um, then they have this monitoring component, which we talked about earlier, very important part of the process, because you have to know if earthquakes are happening in order to stop, uh, stop the problem. And then they have the stoplight system. So in this example, if there's no um, seismicity with a magnitude uh, greater than zero, then the hydraulic fracturing plan can go ahead. If they start to induce events greater than zero, but less than 0 0.5, then um, basically that means proceed with the caution, maybe change um, the injection scheme a little bit to try to lessen the risk of inducing events. Um, and you can see 0 0.5 is a pretty small threshold. Um, in this scale, they show you that a 0 0.5 would generally not be felt at the surface. Um, even one to two would generally not be felt at the surface. So um, 
Their stoplight, in this example, if you hit a magnitude of 0 0.5, then operations must stop. And the whole situation needs to get reevaluated and um, before anything can proceed. So that's a, a very low threshold. And the reason is that most of the hydraulic fracturing is being done in heavily populated areas and also in um, a society that perhaps has a lower tolerance for this type of um, situation. So to, to contrast that with somewhere else in the world, this is the traffic light protocol for Alberta here in Canada, and it's very, very different, right? Um, you can induce anything up to a magnitude two and no action is required. If you're above two, then that's your proceed with caution. You have to notify the regulator and you need to um, have some kind of response plan that you act on at that point. And then if you hit a four, then that's when you have to stop operations and reevaluate, um, get approval before you can continue operating. So very, very different. And the reasons for that are many, but one of the biggest is population density. Um, a lot of the oil and gas activity in Alberta is happening where there's very low population density, um, very little infrastructure. And so, so the overall risk of any kind of damage um, is low and, people's comfort levels are a little bit um, better because there's, they're not afraid of anything serious happening. So um, really depends where you are in the world, how this type of plan gets implemented, but these types of plans are very common now in different areas of the world. So um, in the UK, sticking with that example here for another slide, um, they've actually banned hydraulic fracturing a couple of times now. Um, they did it about five or six years ago, um, and then they allowed some hydraulic fracturing to happen within the last year or so, and then they banned it again, I believe. Um, so there are a few places around the world where hydraulic fracturing has been outright banned, and only part of the reason is induced seismicity. Um, a lot of it is because the public is concerned that hydraulic fracturing is going to um, as you can see from the protest signs here, poison groundwater or contaminate farmland or whatever. Um, and it's so that there is a societal component as to how much people will accept these um, implications of oil and gas activity. And hydraulic fracturing and induced seismicity has been instrumental in some places, just banning fracturing altogether. Um, there's an excellent review paper from 2018. The reference is down here and it's open source and it's tied to this website called the Human Induced Earthquake Database. And I've got the, uh, the link up here, www.inducedearthquakes.org. And um, I've got two maps, snapshots of two maps here, the North American map and then Europe and Asia. And um, you can see kind of the different colors refer to different types of activities causing induced seismicity and um, the yellow being hydraulic fracturing, you can see quite common here in Canada, less common in Europe, much more common in Europe, say in China is water reservoir impoundment. Um, it's an excellent website keeping track of human induced earthquakes and um, they've, they show a breakdown of the different causes here, and you can see the number one cause at this point in time is hydraulic fracturing, um, and mining is second, water impoundments next, and then conventional oil and gas activities, and then a whole bunch of others with very kind of low contributions to the overall induced seismicity database. Okay, so now we're going to get a little bit more technical about induced seismicity, the kind of more of the how and why it happens. So um, also in 2018, there was a conference here in, in Canada at the Banff International Induced Seismicity Workshop, and Bill Ellsworth from the U.S. Geological Survey and Stanford University gave the keynote address, and so I've borrowed one of his slides here, and um, he was kind of going over the state of knowledge at this point, and the key points regarding the stress in the earth um, are here. So 
Stress in the Earth's crust is at a near critical state. Um, more Coulomb theory can explain fault activation in many but not all cases. Induced earthquakes follow the Gutenberg-Richter magnitude frequency relation, so they behave kind of the same as natural earthquakes. Induced earthquake magnitude frequency statistics imply a nearly self-similar strength heterogeneity spectrum. That's a mouthful. I'm not going to get any further into that. Um, and then when induced earthquakes occur, they, I would, I would say they can release tectonic stress. Uh, well, they do release tectonic stress and they can be as strong as natural earthquakes in the same reason. So induced seismicity is not necessarily smaller events than natural events would be. I'm going to elaborate in the rest of my talk on just a couple of points from this list. And the first being stress in the Earth's crust and the second being more Coulomb theory and why we think that accounts for a lot of induced seismicity. So um, the Earth's crust is under stress and the sources of that stress are many. The primary source is plate tectonics. There's lots of other contributors as well. Um, a, a good example, easy one to picture is glaciation and deglaciation. You can imagine the weight of a glacier and then the removal of that glacier can also affect the stress state. But the primary driving stresses are the plate te tectonic stresses. And um, we've divided the Earth's crust into essentially three different um, categories. And those categories are defined by the relative stress magnitudes in the crust. So we have three principal stresses and usually, not in every case, but usually one is vertical and we call that the vertical stress or SV sometimes referred to as the overburden or the weight of the rock at any given point in depth. At depth. Um, and then the other two are horizontal and they don't necessarily have the same magnitude. So we denote one SH max and one SH min. So one being greater than the other. So if you're in a case where the minimum horizontal stress is the minimum stress in the crust, and the intermediate stress is the maximum horizontal stress, and the greatest stress is the vertical stress, you're in what we call a normal faulting stress regime. On the other hand, if you're in an area where the vertical stress is the intermediate stress, and the maximum horizontal stress is greater than that, and the minimum horizontal stress is less than that, then you're in what we call a straight slip stress regime. And then finally, if you're in an environment where the vertical stress is the smallest stress and SH min is greater than that and SH max is even greater than that, then you're in what we call a thrust or reverse faulting stress regime. So take a note of these colors here, red, green, and blue, because I got these figures from what is called the world stress map. And here's a snapshot from the world stress map. The World Stress Map Project has been around for quite a long time now. I think it dating back probably to the early 1990s, if not earlier. And it is um, a collection of stress data from around the world, a growing collection. And what you're looking at are these, uh, what these symbols represent is um, the orientation of the maximum horizontal stress, so the long axis of any one of these tick marks gives you the orientation of the maximum horizontal stress. And then the color represents the stress regime. So if I go back, you recall red is normal faulting and green is strike slip and blue is thrust faulting. So you can see in this map of primarily Europe, um, you have some areas that have a definite preference for one stress regime and other areas where you get all three different stress regimes in relatively close proximity to each other. Where a tick mark doesn't have a color, that means we don't have that relative stress magnitude information. We just have the orientation of SH max. And also you should notice how the orientation of SH max can vary. So here, let's say we have a very consistent almost north-south a little bit northwest oriented SH max, and in other parts of the crust, we have a very variable orientation of SH max. So these are some of the key 
pieces of information we need to start understanding the geomechanics of induced seismicity is what is the state of stress in the crust where we're um, trying to understand what's going on. So I'm gonna get into more Coulomb theory here, which is relatively simple. Um, we have our three principal stresses that we just talked about, and we have some fracture plane that has some kind of 3D orientation you know, in that space. And what we do is some fancy math to take those three principal stresses and transform them into what are called the normal stress and the shear stress acting on the fracture plane. So the shear stress acts parallel to the fracture plane and the normal stress acts perpendicular to the fracture plane. And so if we have a collection, I just have a cartoon here, a collection of different fractures at different orientations, we do this calculation for each one and we plot the results over here on what's called a Moore diagram. Now the other thing we need to consider is pore pressure. So pore pressure is the pressure of the fluid within the rock. And that fluid actually um, supports some of the stress. And so it acts against um, the stresses themselves, um, but it only acts against the normal stress, not the shear stress. So we have this reduced stress called the effective normal stress, which is the normal stress minus the pore pressure. And that's what we plot over here on the Moore diagram is the effective normal stress and the shear stress on each one of the fracture planes. And when we do that, we get some kind of population of points here. Now, if you're having trouble picturing shear and normal stress, I have a little um, cartoon to show you. And when I teach in person, I usually do this with props. I'll grab some books or somebody's cell phone and put it on a book and kind of do this in real life and people can see what happens. But I don't have that privilege today because we're doing everything online. So um, I created this little cartoon to show the same thing. So imagine you have two books, one on top of each other on a table. Um, if they're just sitting there, then there's normal stress acting on them which is basically just their weight because of gravity. And there's no shear stress, nothing pushing them parallel to the, the interface between the two books, which is our pretend fracture. Now, if we lift those books a little bit, um, suddenly now there is some shear stress acting on that interface between the two books. And the normal stress now, which is still perpendicular to the books, is decreased. So some amount of that total normal stress from before, which was all due to gravity, has now been transformed into shear stress acting parallel to our pretend fracture. Okay, but there's some amount of frictional strength on that surface between the two books. So that's what's keeping book one from sliding off of book two. But if we keep lifting the books, um, the shear stress is gonna keep increasing the normal stress has decreased even more, so that's um, kind of reducing the stress that's keeping the books stuck together. And at some point, we're gonna overcome the frictional strength between the two books, and one book is gonna slide off the other. So that's kind of what I'm talking about with our fractures. So this line that goes through our Moore diagram at an angle here is um, called the failure line, and the slope is defined by what's called the coefficient of sliding friction. You can think of that as the frictional strength between our two books, it's a measure of frictional um, resistance to sliding. And you see that some of our fracture points plot above this line, and those are what we call critically stressed fractures. That means, sort of like here, we had a critically stressed book interface and book one slid off of book two. So we actually have that situation in the Earth's crust. We have fractures and faults of all sizes and all orientations, and some of those are gonna be critically stressed. Um, and so then we have to think about what happens when we increase the fluid pressure. So remember, we're subtracting the fluid pressure from the normal stress to create or to calculate this effective normal stress. If we increase the pressure, pore pressure, that's gonna cause 
the sigma n, or effective normal stress, to decrease. What that means is on our Moore diagram is this entire, what we call the Moore circle, or the, the, the semicircle that contains all our possible fracture points is going to move towards the y-axis. So as that happens, you can see all the points move with it. And now one point that was not in the critically stressed area before is now in the critically stressed area. So what we've done is we've basically caused, just by increasing the fluid pressure, we've caused one of our fractures, our cartoon fractures, to become critically stressed. And this is essentially what we think is the mechanism behind many um, cases of induced seismicity. So to show you an example of taking this theory and putting it into practice, I've got a figure here from relatively recent paper looking at induced seismicity in the Permian Basin in Texas and New Mexico, a place where um, unconventional reservoir development has really exploded over the past 10 or 15, 20 years. Um, and uh, so there's been some induced seismicity associated with that. And there's also been, there's quite a bit of information about faults. So there's quite a bit of faults that have been mapped in the area. So this is one little snapshot of that study area. And you see it's actually shown twice. And the difference between these two cases is one is SHMAX is oriented according to these arrows here. And the other is that SHMAX is more northwest, southeast. So there's some uncertainty in this area as to what the stress orientation is, and the authors are looking at two different scenarios and what that effect has on uh, induced seismicity risk. So you can see that there are these mapped faults, and they have uh, colors all along them. And the colors change as the fault orientations change. And that color is related to that more Coulomb theory that we just talked about. So how how close are those fault segments to being critically stressed? And that is being translated into um, something called fault slip potential, which is shown as a percentage. And the higher that value, the riskier the fault is, or the closer it is to being critically stressed, given that particular stress orientation, and what we know about the magnitudes of the other stresses in that area. And so you can see, Portions of the fault that are more parallel to SHMAX are the ones that have higher fault slip potential on them. So therefore, if SHMAX orientation changes, then the risk along the different fault segments is going to change. In this case, a large section of this Grisham fault has a fairly high, relatively high slip risk, whereas if SHMAX is oriented more northwest southeast, the slip risk along the Grisham fault is much lower. And all of this is done assuming a pressure increase of just 4% above what is called the hydrostatic. The hydrostatic being a normal pore pressure for um, whatever depth the fault is at. So 4% um, is not a very large pressure increase. Uh, and so that speaks to the fact that it doesn't really take a huge increase in fluid pressure to uh, cause some risk of induced seismicity in most locations. Another example I've got to show you is um, the case where uh, this is a, a, pay, um, a report that I actually worked on several years ago. It's of an area in British Columbia where they were looking at injecting wastewater and uh, into this formation called the Beloy Formation. And um, the area had been mapped out for geologic favorability for injection. So um, the people who did that work were looking for places where there was good porosity and permeability for injecting the wastewater and storing the wastewater. Um, and you can see they have some areas graded. This is the study area boundary in brown here. And within that, they've got some medium and high favorability areas for this wastewater injection. We did the work of constraining the stresses or, or figuring out what our stress magnitudes were and our stress orientations and then looking at, similar to that last example, we were looking at how much pressure would it 
take to cause um, faults of various orientations to become critically stressed. And so where we could, where we could do that analysis, we could uh, make this what we call a stereo net plot. So what this plot is showing you, it's trying to provide information about all possible fracture or fault orientations. And each little dot, so two of these, in two of these examples, we had some actual fracture information. And so each fracture is plotted as a little dot on the stereo net. And that little dot corresponds to what is called the fracture pole. So a fracture is a planar surface. I think you can see me. My hand is the plane. Um, and then the pole is perpendicular to that. And this is what we call a lower hemisphere stereo plot. So it's like you're looking down. And if you have a horizontal fracture, the pole is going to be vertical. So in this plot, the pole would would be right in the middle of the plot. And then as the fracture dip increases, the pole moves in the opposite direction. So say this little cluster of fractures here, that represents fractures dipping, say about um, 30 degrees to the southwest. So by having the entire stereo net, we can look at theoretically fractures or faults at every possible orientation. And we can say, how much pressure increase would it take to cause that fracture or fault to become critically stressed? And that's what the colors on the stereo nets are showing you. So this is a delta P or that change in increase in pore pressure from zero to 60 megapascals. Um, you can see for most of this area, the range that is actually on the plots is somewhere around um, 10, say, to about 45 MPA or maybe 50. So the smaller the increase in pressure that it would take to cause a fracture or fault to become critically stressed, the greater the risk, right? It means that under scenarios of um, less injection, you are having more risk of slip on those fractures or faults. Unfortunately, um, even though geomechanically this is a very meaningful way to do this type of analysis, the regulators find it extremely difficult to use this information to um, create legislation that they think will be effective in preventing induced seismicity. So one of the ways that could be done would be to say, okay, if you're in this area, you know, we don't want you to inject more than, say, um, at, get a pressure, subsurface pressure that's more than 15 MPA above the um, natural fluid pressure in the subsurface. But um, there's so much uncertainty, and um, in, in the way all this comes together, as you imagine, I, I'm not going to get into stress determination, but um, there's a lot of different types of data types that need to go into those calculations and there's uncertainty in each and every input. So there's quite a bit of resulting uncertainty in the, in the end calculations. And um, it's very hard for not just regulators, but for operators or any, anyone really to know exactly how to make decisions when there's so much uncertainty in the calculations. One thing I'm not really going to talk about, but I want you to be aware of is poroelastic loading. So we, We've now talked about Coulomb failure and how we think that accounts for a lot of induced seismicity, but it's not something that we think is responsible for all induced seismicity. And in fact, um, the American Rock Mechanics Association throughout this very strange spring and summer we're having, um, there's a couple technical interest groups within that organization. One is on hydraulic fracturing and another one is on induced seismicity and they've both been doing a series of webinars um, over the past several months. And um, one webinar was by somebody talking about the induced seismicity situation in the United Kingdom and some models that they've done to try to explain the induced seismicity there. And I found it interesting that they, in particular, um, had to invoke some kind of poroelastic effect to be able to get their models to explain the induced seismicity that they were trying to 
understand. Um, so in this Coulomb failure, we've been talking about the pressure change has to reach the fault. So e the fault has to be in hydraulic communication, either with um, an existing natural fracture network or because our well or our hydraulic fracture actually intersected with the fault. In the poroelastic case, that doesn't have to happen. So the pressure front creates a stress perturbation ahead of it that can change the stress loading conditions on the fault even before the fluid pressure gets there. And so that, that explains some induced seismicity as well. Um, and it's not just, I just noted that down here in this particular example that I borrowed from the Alberta Energy Regulator, it shows a reverse fault, but this isn't, con uh, con this isn't restricted to only reverse faulting environment. Poroelastic effects can exist in other types of stress environments as well. And um, this is something, poroelasticity was something that was a big part of earlier models when we were looking at um, conventional reservoirs. So permeable and porous reservoirs that would deform um, as the fluid pressure was reduced inside, inside of them. So we call this depletion induced seismicity. So as you extract fluid from the modeled reservoir, um, you're reducing that pressure support and the reservoir can actually deform or compact and that can cause um, deformation as well in the earth above it and around the reservoir. And so there were some relatively earlier models done to explain induced seismicity due to this phenomenon. And in this particular example, which is a pretty classic example, um, what happens depends on what kind of stress regime you're in. So if you're in a compressional stress regime, you get different kinds of faulting. You get reverse faulting promoted um, both above and uh, below the reservoir, as shown down here, if you're familiar with beach ball diagrams. Uh, and in contrast, if you're in an extensional stress environment, um, you would get more normal faulting promoted at the edges of the reservoir. So, so the poroelastic theory helped us kind of understand more conventional cases like this. And the final thing I'm going to touch on is um, understanding our fractures and faults. So I mentioned it earlier that one of the remaining challenges in understanding induced seismicity is whether or not we have fractured faults and what are their orientations, where are they in the subsurface. So if we look at this chart, this plot, it exists, uh, I'm not sure exactly where I got this particular version, but um, you see this in lots of literature. Um, very variations of it. So what it's showing is earthquake magnitude on this axis. Um, on the other y axis, it's showing earthquake moment, which is a measure of the energy that uh, is released by the earthquake. And then along the x axis is the fault patch size. So essentially the relative size of the fault that um, would correspond to an earthquake with a given magnitude and um, energy release. So as we get up here, right, we start at negative three earthquake magnitude, go all the way up to eight. Um, minor, three to four is considered minor, could be felt, but probably doesn't cause damage. That corresponds, if you go over here to the plotted data, um, corresponds to slip on a fault of about a centimeter and fault size anywhere from, um, say, 100 to 1,000 meters in size. So if we look at our typical range of induced seismicity, just let's estimate induced seismicity is usually between zero and five MPA, um, magnitude, sorry. We're looking at faults and fractures anywhere from um, less than 10 meters in size to 10,000 meters in size. So quite a range. And um, how are we going to know, especially on the smaller end, how are we going to know if we have small faults in the subsurface? So the various types of data we have to try to understand our fractures and faults um, ranges from logs to seismic to outcrop data, and each one has some limitations. If we 
are looking at image and dip meter logs that were collected in wells. Um, and the same with core. There's a sampling bias that comes from the well orientation. So you can probably picture it if you're if you're drilling a vertical well, you're not very likely to intersect vertical fractures, but you are more likely to intersect horizontal fractures. So the orientation of the well itself creates a sampling bias. Um, also in image logs, definitely um, bedding parallel fractures and faults are difficult to identify. In core, we can generally see those features um, but we can also be a bit confounded by fractures that are induced during the entire coring process. So when we core, we actually drill and collect. Uh, we drill out around a part of the rock so that we collect a long rock sample, and we pull that out of the earth. And that whole process of cutting that core and taking that core out from the subsurface can induce some kind of fracturing in the core. Um, in outcrop, we, it may not necessarily represent what is going on in the subsurface. Um, you know, for example, that the Colorado example I showed at the very beginning, that injection was happening at nearly four kilometers depth. So does a rock at the surface really represent a rock at four kilometers depth? And then finally, um, seismic. It can only identify relatively large features just because of the resolution of that technology. Um, it's also high, uh, difficult to resolve things that are highly dipping, so nearly vertical, especially if there's not much offset on that fault uh, from one side to the other. So, And um, one of the problems we've found, working in Western Canada in particular, um, there's a lot of public data. Most well data from oil and gas wells is public. So we have public logs, we have public core, we have public drilling information, but seismic interpretations are not public. They, um, the seismic data is proprietary to the companies that collect it, and the interpretations are usually proprietary to the operators or um, consulting companies that do the interpretation. So we're not able to assess um, risk on faults because we don't know they're there. Okay. And um, here's an example of why this, this topic might be quite important for induced seismicity is we're starting to see uh, one common theme in a lot of areas where we see induced seismicity are these bedding parallel surfaces in the core that sh show um, what we call slick insides or slick in lines on them. They're highly polished and they show evidence that the rock has moved uh, from one side to the other along that surface, and um, we're not quite sure exactly how important these are for the induced seismicity story, but um, we do see these features in a lot of areas where we have induced seismicity. So it really is important for us to be able to understand the fractures in the subsurface. So I'm going to end with a quote. Um, Although much is known about how earthquakes are induced by deep well injection, a full understanding of earthquake process is far from complete. Um, many issues remain unresolved and as such produce large uncertainties in the confidence with which adequate and appropriate regulations can be formulated. So that quote comes from that 1990 USGS report. Um, that was 30 years ago, and I think the quote remains true today, not just for deep well injection, but for a lot of activities that are causing induced seismicity. I think this last sentence is probably the most important is that we have many unresolved issues and, and high levels of uncertainty. And that makes it difficult for oil and gas operators and regulators to know exactly how to deal with the issue. So um, I hope that gave you um, an overview of kind of what induced seismicity is, um, what causes it, where and how long it's been happening, and what we have been trying to do about it and where some of the work is remaining to be done. Maybe one of you will solve this problem throughout your career. That would be great. Um, in the meantime, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the stuff I presented or maybe some something just related to it. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Amy, for the great presentation. Uh, we have quite a few questions, actually. So I'm um, okay. just going to pick um, three or four. 
so the first question, uh, if there is a delay between an activity and seismic activity observed, how we can conclude that activity in question uh, was the responsible? Is it by the other, what? For the size? I'm not, I'm not sure. I know, they probably mean, um, yeah. So what you do in that case is um, you can consider some of the, uh, the other factors. It was way back here, so I can try to get to it. But, um, you know, that's why there's a lot of different considerations when you're trying to link specific events to specific activities. Um, and timing is a really confounding one sometimes, especially if it takes a while for the event to happen. And that's where... Lots, one of the things I didn't really get into in this presentation because it's far too large a topic is um, modeling of induced seismicity because there are many approaches, many opinions, um, and it's just too huge a topic. But that is where modeling comes into play, is um, mod coming up with a model that's physically realistic and that can explain how that event could happen even sometime after the activity happened, that might help you link that event to that activity. Okay, um, second question. Someone is asking if the magnitudes of induced seismicity in ranges between zero and three, uh, that humans don't actually feel it, why it's a, a matter of a public concern. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question because I'm not really tuned into the concerned public because I'm not part of it because I kind of understand what is behind everything. And um, I, I suspect, let's just say, it's, I suspect it's just discomfort with um, anyone who doesn't understand how seismicity works and what the risk is and what the potential danger is. You know, they may think that smaller events are going to lead to larger events, and maybe those larger events will be problematic. And and it, it could also be, um, you know, regulators wanting to stop an activity before it has time to create an event that is um, more problematic. Okay, so um, third question, uh, how can we know the magnitude is more or uh, more than 0.5 or less to proceed with hydraulic fracturing? Um, so that's where the monitoring comes in. So they've got some type of monitoring, probably some microseismic monitoring or something that allows them to detect. So um, even if we can't feel an event, we have instruments that can detect them. So that monitoring piece is what detects those small events. And as long as an event doesn't reach, um, you know, that certain threshold, activity can continue as planned. Okay. Um, the fracture surface is projected on stereo nets or its pole? And why? Um, not understanding that question. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll just skip it. Uh, Sorry about that. Because uh, <laughs> I won't be able to, to ask them. So, um, Someone is asking about the last slide. Uh, why is uh, there's negative number on um, the earthquake chart? And why does the scale go negative? Here, yes. Um, uh, the scale goes negative. Um, I, I don't know exactly why the scale goes negative, but it does. And, um, and it accounts for very small events. Um, and these are the type of events that we do detect with microseismic. Um, in the case of, so if you've ever seen clouds of microseismic data that kind of outline where we think our hydraulic fracture is going, most of those events are gonna be in that range of the negative magnitudes. Just, it just describes very, very small events, small energy release on small fractures. Okay, um, last question. Why features parallel to the layers are difficult to identify an image and depth meter logs? 
That's a good question. Um, I don't have an example of an image log handy to show you very quickly, um, but what the image logs generally show quite clearly um, is the, the bedding or the very small changes in lithology. And so if you get a fracture that's parallel to that, you can't tell if that's just a lithology change or it's actually a fracture. There's different types of imaging log technology. So some of the image logs are better at that than others. Um, but for the most part, it can be quite difficult to distinguish between a fracture and just a bedding surface in the images. Okay, perfect. So uh, this concludes the question part. Thank you so much for joining us today and for the very informative lecture. And it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you very much. Yeah. I really applaud what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys have a good sleep and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. You. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.